I was just texting with uh, Jennifer. Said that uh, Susan came over. And she brought a friend. <laughs> she brought a friend. Yeah. It was uh, a surprise to me, anyways. Right. <laughs> <laughs> It's almost like he was hand-picked. Yeah, I was reading what Jim was saying. I was like, what? <laughs> like, yeah. Could have picked a more perfect <laughs> Yeah. She hasn't answered Jennifer's question on what his name was or is. Uh, so I don't know yet. <laughs> I thought he had given me his card, but when I went and looked at it, it's her card he gave me. So is he more like her kind of security because she's walking on these random places, or is that probably to appear? Yeah, I suspect. I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure, but. Uh, about an hour, an hour and a half earlier, a white car drove, uh, I think it was a station wagon, drove by very slowly and went and turned in the driveway next door to the south of us here uh, and hid behind the tree trying to look over and seeing what she could see out in the field. And I was, I think, making breakfast or something to that effect. So she, uh, if that was her, decided not to come without some security beyond herself and went to Kempville because she drove north when she came out of the driveway um, and and left a message shortly thereafter that they'd be here uh, by uh, uh, within within an hour or so, I think it was, she said that it put it around 10 o'clock. Or... Right. So she arrived, he was driving a maroon car and they both came out uh, and I came from the field to see the car uh, just inside the driveway. Um, they wanted to talk to me and I said, no, first of all, you got to have a look at the condition of the house before we discuss anything. And she said, I don't want to go in the house. I said, I'm not asking you to go in the house. I'm asking you to look at the outside of the house and see how water affects foundations and water affects basements. So I walked them over to the house and, of course, all the stairs to the basement outside are broken. Uh, um, stairs have fallen over. And I said, if you look at the window that's on the side here, you'll uh, see approximately how high the water comes. And, of course, without a sump pump functioning because there's no hydro, it also fills to the same level inside the basement, which would, in fact, put it somewhere around a waist high. And uh, if this window is in the stairwell leading downstairs. Um, and then um, we went... Uh, to where their car was parked, and I have some chairs there and sat. And um, she basically said that uh, the one thing they could do is save me money on transport. And uh, I said, that's that's handy because 
eventually cost me fifty dollars each way, hundred bucks to go to town. Right. So she, she said, with with us, it would be only one payment of twenty five dollars, um, and you would call a day or two ahead of time. So much for emergencies. Um, and and book an appointment, and someone would come and pick you up and take you to do whatever you needed to do, groceries or or uh, banking or post office or whatever, and then bring you back home. You give them twenty five dollars, you know. So I said, well, that that, that sounds reasonable. Uh, it's not basically the thing I need the most because what I need the most is a meal. (laughs) A meal uh, at lunchtime every now and then would be a great help. And I have an arrangement at the front here for the postman that if there's no room in the mailbox, he's to put it on the seat of the truck uh, and um, I'll find it there. Uh, so a meal could do that too. And she didn't give any answer that I could figure out. Was she saying it's possible or it's not possible? All she was offering was the journey. So she asked me if I had... Um, uh, ID cards from the health department uh, because that's how they get their money back. Because twenty-five dollars, obviously, she meant would not cover their costs, and balance okay. would come. Yeah, balance would come from from a government department. So I I let her take down my ID, um, having to think about this. Um, But we we had, the the man and I discussed uh, a little bit, and he had said, uh, oh, I know you. Uh, I was a, a policeman before I retired. I said, that's nice. He said, as a matter of fact, I was on Parliament Hill. <laughs> 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 I said, that, that's a strange coincidence. Uh, and he, um, he said, by the way, on the way here, I was talking to Sue about Lynn Coulter. And I said, you know Lynn Coulter? And he said something like, yeah, we're related. And I didn't quite get what he meant, but it sounded like son-in-law or something. Mm. Uh, now, she didn't say he was the guy who would pick me up. Uh, she inferred that, you know, the guy would pick you up, but didn't tell me it's this guy. So... Right. It probably is that that guy was there only for her protection. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I said, you know, I spent a thousand days on Parliament Hill. Um, I was under constant surveillance by uh, over 20 cameras from the minute I got there to the minute I left. and even when I went to the washroom. Um, why anybody would would uh, fear that violence is a part of me, uh, I, I have no understanding of that. But it seems that the Ontario Pro- Provincial Police worries about that because of what I've seen them do come in and basically corner me while hydro cuts trees that I forbade them to cut and stuff like that over the years. You know, it's now 30 years or something. 
So I asked Jennifer to contact her and get his name uh, to see if the cell can investigate. But the cell has pictures of them, you know, when he came. They have almost as many cameras as on Parliament Hill. <laughs> especially uh, focused on the driveway. So, anyways, that's it. She wrote them a letter. hasn't got a response as far as I can tell yet. And in my discussions with the cell, uh, they said, uh, you know, uh, the deal of $25 is interesting. However, uh, with this guy involved, it's it's a totally different story. Um, until we know exactly who he is and and how he's viewed, you gotta remember that if he came to pick you up, what guarantees do you have that he doesn't drive you to a police station and a couple of um, policemen come out and drive you and put you into a cell and and then send you to a critically insane asylum or some damn thing. So I said, well, that that's worth consideration. To me, it's not the end all. Um, it's only a possibility, and it depends on a further investigation of who that guy really is and whether or not human beings can trust ex-policemen working for an agency that is funded by uh, charity. Well, it's also interesting to... Mon- I'm saying it's, uh, it's interesting. Ahead. It's interesting too that, you know, after uh, she knew I gave your information, and then her her arrival got delayed by a week or two or whatever it took. You know, it wasn't like she had to rearrange her time because maybe she had to either find this guy or it was either a coincidence, <laughs> right? Or yeah. or the conversation was very interesting on the ride back <laughs> with them. Right? Yeah. yeah. I tell you, her, I wouldn't trust. She, um, just as they left, she got between him and me as he was going towards the driver's door and she was going towards the passenger's door. And she said, and I'd like to remind you that if you do get Uh, rides, Um, you shouldn't be discussing the circumstances that got you here or asking the person about their circumstances. You know, this is just a ride to town, do your stuff, come back, pay the 25, and that's it. So when somebody tells me that A charitable organization supposedly support uh, and home care doesn't want to go into a home that has been damaged, (laughs) Uh, doesn't want you to discuss why you're living outdoors, doesn't want anything to do with the real problem, is funded by United Appeal, which is basically an organization that collects uh, money off people's paychecks and government and corporations and stuff like that. Um, it, it all seems like in-house activity for them and not for the patient. It was uh, as well, you know, confirmed by the fact that three uh, weeks in a row, it was being put off till next Wednesday. 
It was almost an automatic thing. Well, maybe next Wednesday. You know, so, uh, home care. Excuse yeah. me. <laughs> and what, what if you were? If she, she says she deals with seniors all the time. Cause that's her department. So if you think every senior is able to just get up and walk and meet you outside and sit on the porch or whatever, you're like, why doesn't she want to go inside? <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. Supposed to assess the situation. She said, she said <laughs> obviously, frailty is not your problem. <laughs> And one of the things she said while she was here, I said, you know, it's not because they didn't try. I mean, hmm. how would you do if if you had to live outdoors because your house, uh, the last time you laid in your bed, half the ceiling fell on your head, you know, and you got rats running around upstairs, uh who hadn't figured out yet that there are cats in the house. <laughs> and uh, once they jumped, one of them jumped down into the kitchen, well, the cat, the uh, cats won and rats went away. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, you, you got things going on, like there's a tree out in front that has fallen on the house last year. Um, fallen on the roof. Fortunately, because of the way the branches are shaped and everything, it didn't crush anything. It just kind of laid there. But I said, you know, they came without permission, defended by the police, who kept me aside and watched over me for what reason I have no idea because I have in 78 years, not been known as a violent person, uh, but that's how they handled it. They uh, they cut the branches that they wanted, and this time, as opposed to last time, they threw them over the fence and took them away. But nobody offered maybe to walk 10 feet over, 20 feet over, and say, would you like us to cut the branches off your roof? You know, nobody offered that. They, they asked when it happened, and they told them, you know, last year or sometime. So it, it, there is no uh, empathy that I can feel or imagine even from any of those people, just like my neighbors around. No empathy. Nobody coming to say, you know, anything I can do. I know you've had your hydro cut off. <laughs> anything I can do. Yeah, maybe you can put this extension over the heater in my truck or something. And I've got the extensions. All I need is a place to plug it in, you know. They used to go to the post at the back field until they cut off the power, you know. Yeah. Hey, that's the world we live in, Danny, is, is the um, good guys were the West, the bad guys were the Nazis. And after the war, the Nazis came over here, and the good guys went over there. And yeah. from the mid-'70s onwards, police aren't police anymore. You know, they, they don't care about people. They, uh, they care about being in the media. Having nice stories told about how nice they are by a nice media. It makes me feel it in my gut. That's what it makes me feel is, is how come a guy like you and Jerd and, um, Army from Scotland and, you know, that, that type of thing. How can they come? Uh, 
from Texas to Canada and and sneak in, basically, in order to come and see for themselves the conditions and and how is it impossible for next door neighbors to do the same thing? Know his neighbor. When I asked when I asked the cell that same question, he said the story was written as a uh, man from thousands of years ago who was warning his neighbors about a coming flood. Noah, which basically in the language it was originally written, is is uh, one no way in French. And no way will the neighbors help. So he, he said, we just wanted a chance to see how much things have changed in thousands of years. The neighbors don't care. Don't do anything. And it's not that there aren't people in the world that would do something, because there are people in the world that would do something, you and Jared are two of them. So. But why is it that neighbors just don't care? Matter of fact, when I first arrived on the farm, a young man, probably a teenager, late teens, uh, came from next door, you could uh, tell immediately that he was somewhat mentally handicapped, but, but not to the extent of being a problem type of thing. And he said, uh, you know, uh, I do gardens. And if you're going to dig a, a garden, uh, I would I would do the cultivating and stuff like that for for twenty dollars. Uh, and I said, that's fine. Uh, here's twenty dollars. <laughs> this is where I want a garden. And he went out and he did the the original patch. Never came back. Somebody talked to him, parents or other people, and told them, no, no, you can't go there. What is it (laughs) about being a defendant of democracy that you can stand on Parliament Hill and teachers with school buses full of kids are coming to teach them about democracy on Parliament Hill, but they won't allow the kids to approach a protester, no matter how um, sane the argument looks or um, the means by which he is protesting is Democracy itself. They won't let the kids go. They only like it when it takes place in history books. Yeah. Yeah. Media. Books. Papers. Television. Radio. It's the only thing, if they hear it there, that's okay then. If the media is the center of the problem and they don't want people to know certain things, 
such as there was a world before 4000 BC, and it expands into the triple, if not quadruple, numbers of years. Um, certainly, um, 40, 50,000 BC is, is modern compared to uh, 4 million years. And, and that's the reality is someone is hiding and using genetic engineering to restructure humans for a 10,000 year period, which for all intents and purposes began as the end of the Ice Age approach, about 8,000 BC, to the present time, which makes it 10,000 years. And then these people that were manufactured are no longer needed because the next phase requires different skills and they're going to be destroyed. Or at least an attempt is going to be made uh, in many, many ways. And, and it's funny that there was a major fire in California and the place burnt to the ground was paradise. That was the name of the community, Paradise. It's funny that right now there's a hurricane that spent three days on the Bahamas, mm -hmm. the center being Paradise Island. I know because I, I went there and won prizes when I was a salesman. Twice I was sent to the Bahamas for a couple of weeks or so. Paradise Island. It was interesting they were able to predict. They said, oh, it's going to stay stationary for 36 hours. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and also, they said it just missed the island where Epstein's house was. Yeah. Anyways... And that's the world we apparently live in and the people that we are supposed to save and do what we can. Suffering is part of it, not having the joys of, you know, being uh, out running the show someplace. Uh, while the cell cleanses paradise, which religion calls heaven, of all the nuns that are there because they don't deserve or belong to be there, they only pretended to care while it was all about collecting money, collecting money from women whose husbands died in war, collecting money from friends and neighbors who died of pestilence, famine, or disease, and taking their properties and joining a nunnery and then real estate becoming the capital uh, used to fool people to bullshit their way into becoming the owners of Wall Street. Those nuns are being evicted which is by far, by far the majority. Because the ones who 
refused to do what Mother Superior wanted would not be allowed in heaven if Mother Superior controlled who had access. But question, so, or two questions. First one is, do they know about the cell other than listening to you mention them? If, do they know, like, does the cell know if anyone knows that they're around? And the second question is, second question would be, is, so upon death in this world, it's not, like, how do they get into paradise? Like, there's not like a sifting ground there that creation does that recognizes that they shouldn't necessarily be there? Like, how do they begin to flood it with themselves? Well, it all began when a woman became the leader of a group of women whose name was linked to one, none, uh, both ways. And that group of women and creation had a um, long-term discussion, if you will, now, I'm only repeating what the cell has told me. It's uh, Probably I have it as personal knowledge because it made sense to me right away. But you don't remember when you become a human being again and having basically done that, according to them, 700 times. I don't remember it personally, but when told by you know, it, right. it makes more sense. So um, this group of nuns said that creation could not grasp the difficulty, the poverty, the illness, the lack of knowledge that was available upon the earth because of its own know-everything type of uh, mm -hmm. position, and that they were in a better place as creation's intermediary. The word is satrap, um, that that they, in fact, could do a better job. And, and after being hounded for what appears to be centuries, <laughs> creation said, okay, I disagree, but I'll let you be in charge for a fixed period of time I will not intervene. And that started the God project that God being um, a dog written backwards is is basically the concept of love by everybody wags his tail and does what people hope <laughs> it will do, um, while all the time is only doing it for the purpose of getting to a place of power through money and religion and politics. And over time, established that process, the cell either won't say uh, or they don't know uh, what's the end time of this process. What, you know, what was the original deal? 
Uh, were they given, you know, 10,000 years or 100,000 years or 50,000 years? But the cell is of the opinion that whatever that time frame is, we're getting close to it. And creation prior to a space program which is going to Mars and setting up uh, structures on the moon and stuff like that, um, creation will have control. And to have control is to look at the population of the world and say, somebody messed with the genetic engineering. This is not what was intended to be. This is what a slave is intended to be. And there are different levels of slavery. Uh, the one we are taught about in school is the one that gets beaten up and whipped and uh, not fed properly and kicked and all of that stuff, but they are not the, um, the people who make the difference in the world. Um, bureaucrats are. Bureaucrats do things with no one there to stop them. They uh, have their representative at the Privy Council. Uh, it's like on Parliament Hill, the people of Canada are told that this is where politicians make decisions. Well, it's not true. What happens on Parliament Hill is that process begins by uh, bringing forth ideas. And those ideas are debated but not voted on until a certain thing occurs. Uh, the cabinet goes across the street to a building that was called the Langevin Block when I was young. And at the Langevin Block, they meet the quote-unquote privy councillors. Now, you can take that to mean private councillors, but you can also take it to mean bathrooms toilet counselors because they are all part of the deal. Hang on, I'm getting a call. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, I hear you. Sorry about that, but that was my uh, guy who was supposed to pick up cat food for me on Wednesday. Anyways, he can't make it today, so he said tomorrow. So, so that is is basically the background. Now, what was the first question that ends up being the second answer? Uh, the first question was, um, did, did anyone else, like, you know, for example, like, 
the nuns, are they aware of the cell? Or are you uh, the only one? At certain yeah. levels, they would be, um, I am basically speaking from listening to them talk among themselves, but not ex- expressing it to me uh, directly. But I would say there's, there are, they are levels. And, and the higher uh, the level, the more they command control and money. That's how, that's how it is, as far as I know. Are they aware that, like, there's the group, the cell that, that goes around, like, they can, like, how they know that the nuns are in paradise, do the nuns here know that we know? <laughs> well, it's, it's the same thing as the nuns. The cell has people who are investigators and they are brought in uh, whether they're good at investigating or if they have some connection to what is being investigated. Mm. And the same thing with, would happen with the nuns. They'd be told your job is to work in a school or a hospital or whatever um, and um, you have uh, two bosses, but only one you listen to. <laughs> and that's the way it is. The, the higher uh, ones who deal with money and power, they would be the bosses. And, and the word superior is not an accident of the English language. It's, you know, when we're done doing what we do, creation will allow certain things to happen and it is stated in the Bible in, in coded language as uh, a trade-off between power and a bowl of soup, which they call in the Bible a mess of potage, which in fact in French translates more directly to fish soup. So fish soup, is a flood, a flood that comes off large bodies of water, such as the oceans, uh, much of which is happening today in the Bahamas and on its way uh, north. And I was telling Jennifer some time ago and repeated it, recently was uh, the former Prime Minister of Canada, uh, uh, Stephen Harper, was a piano player. And his favorite song, for whatever reason, uh, we heard him do at different occasions. And the name of the song is Carolina. And now we're looking at a hurricane who appears to be heading to do most damage, starting in Carolina, working their way up until they reach a place in Queens called Flushing, Flushing Meadow. That, by coincidence, is where another flood coming from the Great Lakes on land would end up. Is it a coincidence? What did Harper know more than other people? 
I don't know. They know. They know, but that's not for me to know. My role is to be a spokesperson for the sale, I guess, first of all, uh, because they, they never told me that I was not to mention their arrival. To the contrary, they wanted people to know there was a way out of the mess we're in. Um, but I'm, I'm a message basically from purgatory. And, and purgatory stands basically in the middle between paradise and the Pacific Ocean cleansing station, which is the contrary version of religion's hell because it's water more than fire that does the most damage. Uh, Fire comes also, but the person's already gone, no longer put together in the same DNA as, as they were genetically engineered to be. And there has to be uh, a trial for each person and worse than a trial although not with pain or suffering or anything of, of the physical nature uh, is purgatory because it's basically a waiting line and a waiting line that can run months, years, tens, hundreds, thousands of years long. And depending on how people who um, hurt uh, seniors, uh, in whatever way they did it, determines where they stand in line. Such as, as we stand right now, a bunch of people in government has uh, stolen, so far, approximately $900 a month for three months, $2,700. That that alone, and I don't know anything else they've done, that alone buys them 2,700 years. Stand in line. Imagine you stand in line for a couple of hours at a theater and and you're basically wiped out by the time you get to the door. Imagine standing in line knowing you have 2,700 years to wait before your turn comes. You know? This is based upon just one basic philosophy is that the people who lived the longest suffered the most. And no one has suffered more than the people who are alive today by the simple creation of labor as an accepted means of slavery. As I used to call it at the beginning, slaves who do their own shopping. They spend their entire lives devoted to doing something that the system requires, not 
what they require and the money that they make doesn't even buy happiness. No matter how much they get, it doesn't buy happiness, which is what you're supposed to get when you go to paradise. And the nuns who had the only right to say, yeah, this one, yeah, that one, no, that one, no, that one, they were doing it for self-serving reasons. They were choosing the wrong people on purpose. Only the people that were helping them and should not be in paradise were being directed in that way. And therefore, a cleansing and a placement at the bottom of the line is more where they belong. Now, how long the line is could be thousands, could be millions of years long because you're dealing with approximately seven and a half billion people who have lived and died since that time 10,000 years ago with all the knowledge about genetically engineering being already known. Not the capability of going about manufacturing it in a lab uh, on large scale, but the technology that we are made up of two bodies, one's electric, uh, the other one is DNA. And, and they knew that because they had lived 130,000 years or more. And, and over that period of time, uh, it was ingrained in their DNA what the right and wrong should be and how you arrive at teaching people right or you do wrong to them. And eventually you learn that you can pre-set up the DNA in a manner in which you think it should be rather than the way creation thought it should be. And genetic engineering begins in places that usually consist of uh, manufactured babies based upon the DNA of old people who have demonstrated throughout their lives that they are miserable bastards. <laughs> and the ones who have shown throughout their lives that they are good people who care about old people and children, they um, are not used for genetic engineering. They are used only in task orientation. To go to school, you don't learn how to live. You learn how to do math. Math is the language of scientists. And depending on what math you learn, will determine your approach to things that are in life. And usually, it's not understood 
that that life has a beginning and an end, and then it's not needed anymore. It's not based upon the quality of life. It's based upon how much information in a laboratory, which is the word labor, and in real English, O U R, not just O R. You are in the lab, and you are the story. Story as in Tory, laboratory. And I've been asked to repeat what I know in the order in which I remember it over and over again and would be assisted in that as I grow older and older and older by a woman whose approach to life is opposite to mine because of her background and how she was dealt with as a child and basically all of her life, uh, but is more knowledgeable about the context of uh, the suffering done by elderly people in an asylum for the handicapped, mentally handicapped. It's about as bad as, as life gets in our context, but in their context, they don't know. They don't know that they are there. So the intent in the long run is to build a complex. And it would be divided into little stations. There would be a, a part for uh, mentally handicapped seniors. There would be a part for children, uh, orphan children. There would be a part for every phase of humanity and how they can all be fitted together to enhance their happiness. But the system of bureau bureaucrats, the rats who do the original investigation in a cave uh, outside of the ants who do it on a quantum level, just like our body has cells and particles and such, but it's the quantum part, the subdivision of the subdivision of the subdivision of the subdivision. Of, of different cells or particles in our body because quantum means very small. And the quantum leads to entanglement. So you have quantum entanglement, which is a theory in physics that says you can be in two places at the same time. And doing something to one part automatically is transmitted to the other part. Even if they are thousands of miles away is what phys physics describes, even if they are... Uh, parted by galaxies, one part communicates with the other as soon as 
they are divided in this quantum entanglement, disentanglement system that creation put together. And therefore, uh, each part is as valuable as the rest. So a human being is known by its genetics uh, and is DNA. Whereas pre-birth and after death, it's known more by its electromagnetism, which in English we call ghost. But physics, what they have done is experiments where uh, a very small, uh, smaller than atom thing is shot into a tube and split up in a manner in which one part goes one way, the other part goes the other way. But as soon as either part is dealt with, um, the other part knows, the other part adapts, changes, and, and space is not a problem. Distance is not a problem. It's, it's a very technical explanation, something I hope that I don't have to do with everybody because most people wouldn't get it, but I'm sure that you and Jerd are knowledgeable at the level where you would get it more than most. Yeah. Yep. And, and the two pieces can be reunited down the road, you know. And that basically creates and recreates life, not just human beings, life, all life, animals, vegetables, ants. Think of a, an ant's job. An ant, you'll see, collecting things it believes to be valuable that we humans walk on and spit on and care less about. And they drag it to an entry that leads them down below. But imagine if a group of human beings who were living on the surface of the planet and had gathered information for hundreds of thousands of years, built themselves an underground living space that was at a certain distance between the plates of the earth above them, the mantle of the earth below them, and that allowed them to expand that place, arriving at a time when they say, the conclusions of the evidence we have is that we should, in fact, understand that this is only a dot in a universe so large that none of it can survive forever, but each one has its turn, just like going into court. 
in the lineup, uh, and and unless we understand what we see and know by our own mental capacity and and have recorded in ways different over the years but arriving at a point where there is consensus that this is it we come to the conclusion that we need to build a laboratory on the surface of the earth over a period of 10,000 years that would involve 15 billion of us who are only a few million and then get rid of them once they have given us all the information they have gathered and we'll tell them that their information was valuable when we give them a Nobel Peace Prize or a Nobel Prize for Science or a Nobel Prize for whatever. And, and we'll tell them that they're doing something right in the theater and in writing books and, and in stage shows and, and in newspapers and whatever. We'll give them prizes. But for us, a prize is given to a piece of information that added into what we already know fits perfectly and enhances the ability for us to understand at a point where we stand above it and know more than we did before. And what we'll do is we'll use the next ice age starting in 24,000 BC. We will stop helping people to survive by going underground. Underground, we will study genetics, quantum everything, to its smallest common denominator, while the people who live on the surface of the planet that we've left behind die off. And when most of them are out of the way, we'll go back and destroy the evidence we left on the surface, except for a few hints. And we will begin to make this laboratory built world in period of time around 8000 BC, which basically means 16,000 years undercover from 24,000 to 8,000. My math is right. 16,000 years undercover. But we'll never really come out from undercover. What we will do is use the people that we will make underground as models and find out from the first uh, few thousand years, probably 4,000 years, um, how you make good guys and how you make bad guys. And we'll do it in uh, a mountain in Africa, um, and, and then we'll move everything to the Himalayas uh, across the way and and to make sure everybody understands they're different they'll be brown instead of black 
And the Himalayas will have another mountain that we'll call K2. The mission, the second mission. And from K2, we'll start releasing different individuals and the ones who tend more to peace and love and stuff like that will go out the south of the mountain range of the Himalayas, while the ones uh, who are more warlike soldiers will exit in the north. And we'll see what happens. And, and as with uh, Noah's Ark, when the people didn't listen, uh, we decided that we had not got the right recipe that we were attempting to get uh, from this side of the experiment, the, the forward side of the experiment, and therefore, we would kill them off, except for a few, like Noah and his family. Um, it, it's all a, a story, but it's based upon what was done in, in the past. And, and you can see it on the big 8-0 oh, printed in the Anglican Bible, how the lineup that was going down and extending outwards all of a sudden breaks and falls back in, and that's Noah's space on the original O, oh, original O, oh, O oh, original. Toronto, Ottawa, oh, original. So all of that we will reassemble in a different way, changing the location of the DNA from one place to another, and then you see the line rebuilding back to the direction in which they wanted to go and follows the path down to Abraham at about 2000 BC or so. And then it starts working towards the middle. And as usual, when you change directions, you don't have a plan of where you're going and you go too far. And then you turn around and you come back in the other direction and the shape in which you're building without realizing is a number eight. So the big eight O. Oh. And once you have reached the bottom and have it down pat the way you want it, then you come back in an opposite direction to the direction you took to get there. So you close in the letter A and you close in the O. However, when you get to a certain place, the line goes straight. No more genetic engineering. And that place, I suggest, would be between 1972 to, 19, to 2062, 90 years, so that by the year 2020, people would find out about what went on and what is going on and what will happen when the floods come. And floods are expected everywhere. 
starting with paradise. Quantum entanglement known well to scientists who are in the world of physics but unknown to most people because it's probably the most difficult part of mathematics to teach. I don't know. I never learned it. I just lived it. <laughs> yeah. I'm not smart enough in the context of mathematics to know what physics can do, how quantum physics dealing with the smallest of the smallest of the smallest is different from dealing with what we know as natural cells and chromes and uh, all of the things we know about, uh, although small to us, atoms are not small to creation. And only quantum approaches that area and only the physicists among physicists among physicists uh, work on that level. But it doesn't matter what you do now other than how seniors are dealt with, especially seniors who do not have the mental capacity they used to have. They are the stars of creation. Without them, we wouldn't understand how bad things can get. So, so be it. It is now 4.18, and I hope your recorded work this time. Good. Okay. So be kind to the people you know. If they live long enough, they're all going to be old and senile like us. <laughs> Yes, they have the wisdom. Yeah, and then you'll hope they were there for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bye for now. All right, Glenn. Talk I'll to you again. You. Okay, right.